The views and opinions heard on this show do not necessarily reflect the views of the host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. My breathing had stopped for so long that my heart actually ended up stopping. He saw what I did and said that I was going to die. And then I remember being gone. I wasn't there anymore. I sort of lifted up about six feet above my body. A pinprick of light appeared and came rushing toward me faster than the speed of light. And then this light, all of a sudden it was all completely around me. He says, I am God. Yes, I am real. The main message was loving yourself and loving others. It was clearly shown to me. It was really hard to put into words. It felt like I had been there before. It was just this very personal, impersonal, unconditional love. Welcome back to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. I am your host, Lamont Gates, once again, completely bringing you the world of faith, metaphysicality, and spirituality. Today, my guest suffered from the victim mindset only to discover during her experience that the earthly perception was actually more of a deception. Let's get it started. Ladies and gentlemen, joining me via Skype all the way in British Columbia, Canada, is near-death experiencer and author Sarah McClellan. Sarah, welcome to Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to share my journey and my story. Thank you, Lamont, for inviting me. Not a problem at all. Glad to have you here. So before we get into your near-death experience, tell us a little bit about what you learned as a child concerning religion and or spirituality. Uh, Were there any particular teachings of this topic? Great question. I actually had no religious upbringing and no religious understanding. Um, in fact, I was taught to worship my father. Uh, he was a controller and a rager. And we, there was, there was four women, my sisters and my mother, and we were taught to worship my dad. <clears throat> the only uh, experience I had as a religious or spiritual was that my best friend's mother was uh, Anglican and she would uh, periodically take us to church. And at one point, I remember sitting, we followed the altar boy down to the, the, uh, the, the um, you know, where the children were being educated. And I was sitting on the floor and I remember having this um, experience. I had a, there was a picture of Jesus with a little girl sitting on his lap. And I had this experience of um, unconditional love. It was like this, this, this sparkle went through me. And, and it, it was just this moment of just feeling this absolute love. And, and then the other experience I had was I was raised in Montreal and we went to Notre Dame Church. And I remember going into the church and just feeling the awe, the, just the awe of how beautiful it was. And there was this essence of peace. Um, but other than that, there was no religion. In fact, you know, my father was, was totally against it. So would you say your parents were atheists or just had no regard for religion or spirituality at all? Well, both my parents were um, extremely narcissistic, uh, very self-centered. Um, they both believed that the universe evolved around them. And no, there was no, there was no spirituality. In fact, I remember when I went to the to church with my best friend's mom, my dad actually gave me a handkerchief and wrapped a quarter in the handkerchief because he wanted to remind me that he was my God, so to speak. So it was an interesting, yeah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> was his image imprinted on it? <laughs> Perhaps he was Caesar in a past life. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so why don't we go into your experience? In fact, let's begin prior to it. What led up to your near-death experience? 
Well, being in a raised in a family that was extremely controlling um, and very, you know, very abusive. I was bullied by my father, also bullied at school. Um, I I bounced back and forth from bad situation to bad situation. Uh, I then uh, at 11, I, 11 years old, I kind of came out of my shell and um, discovered boys. Uh, and then I bounced from relationship to relationship. Um, I uh, ended up living uh, with a man that was extremely abusive in my early, late 20s. Um, but he felt like home. He felt like that, that was where I was meant to be. And um, I was helping him raise his two children. And um, we kind of built a family together. And then, um, and then I became pregnant. During the, you know, the pregnancy was long and difficult. Uh, I was due on Christmas Eve. It ended up being New Year's Day where I went into labor. And um, that's kind of what led into my near-death experience. So what was it that happened while you were in labor? Did you die at some point? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, What happened was uh, I ended up panicking on the operating table. Uh, I was in transition. They wheeled me. They were doing emergency C-section. They wheeled me down to OR and they left me on my own in transition. And I, I remember hanging on to the, the, the metal railing of the bed, just trying to get through the pain. Um, and then this, this nurse, uh, beautiful nurse walked in and she knew what was going on and they wheeled me into OR. And by the time I ended up on the operating table at, in OR, I was, I was panicking. Um, I was, you know, like a deer in a headlight. Take us to when you began to experience something more otherworldly. So I came to a point because of all the pain and all of the drama and everything I I had gone through and being on the operating table, I came to this point where I just cried out to God. Um, I just want to die. Like, and I meant it from the depth of my soul. I just, I just couldn't. I couldn't live that way. I could. I couldn't. I couldn't handle it anymore. And um, I fell back. I remember falling back into the bed, and then looking to my left, and um, there was this dark, dark space that was calling me. And I remember going towards this dark space, and as I got closer to it, the pain was so horrific, and and so um, like it just like permeated my soul, so to speak. And I remember I just called out and said, please forgive me. And then the next thing I knew I was enveloped with this beautiful, um, incredible, loving, unconditional acceptance of who I was and all my mess. And I was in a lot of mess in those days. And it was just this, just knowing that I was completely and utterly accepted As I headed towards the light, there was this information that was given to me. And I remember just going, oh, yeah, I knew that. And just kept floating towards the light, just being filled with this absolute beautiful love. And when I got to the crest of the light, I was asked, are you sure this is what you want? Um, And I knew that I had a purpose and a meaning. I had something to do. And I said, no, I have to go back and do what I was meant to do. Now, can you describe what it was you saw in this light? Some say uh, they were able to see a silhouette of a city. Others say a field of some sort with trees and flowers, while some others may say an energy field. I think that if I had passed through the crest of the light, I probably would have had those scenes. But no, I... I, I didn't have those scenes. I had a, a, this just this this spiritual, um, beautiful pink energy that just enveloped me and filled me with um, comfort and you know all the things that I had searched for, all the things that I had actually searched for since I had that experience when I was young in church. It was that unconditional acceptance and just. Being in that space and just understanding that, oh, I'm home. I get it. Like, this is like, I'm, I've got, I'm in that peace. I'm in that love. And it was just this, 
incredible. Ex- just, yeah, it was just a, it wasn't, you know, there were no trees or anything. It was just this absolute envelopment of unconditional acceptance. You mentioned that information was communicated to you. Do you recall what this information was that reminded you? You know, it was reminding me that I wasn't the pain and I wasn't the, I wasn't the drama or the emotional, ex- the earthly experience that I was this beautiful spiritual being that had made a choice. I'd made a choice to be on the earth at that time, at this time, and that I was reminded that the drama and all of that wasn't me. That was, that was the most important piece of it. So, in other words, you existed pre-mortally. You decided to come into this realm and perhaps choose to go through some of your challenges. But likewise, you never ceased to be a child of the light. Absolutely. Abs- I was always a child of the light, but I didn't see it. I didn't, you know, I was born a beautiful, loving soul that had this earthly experience. And that was, that was probably the biggest takeaway was realizing, yeah. That absolutely. So take us to what happened after going back into your body. So when I made the decision, um, no, I need to go back. Um, everything started spinning around really quickly. Um, it was the dark and the light and it all just started spinning. And I remember going back into, I went back into my head. Um, there was this moment of just complete disappointment that I was back and the pain, the physical pain I was in. Um, and then I looked up and, and there was this, like these, uh, uh, bubbles, like droplets on a, on a, on a puddle. And I could see these droplets and there was this high hum, pitched hum in my ear. And I remember saying to myself, Oh, I'm under anesthetic. Okay. Yeah. I get that. And so I settled back into my body. Um, and then the next thing I knew, they were waking me up, uh, pre post, uh, op post post operative. Um, and then just told me I had a nine pound, 10 ounce baby girl. So <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then the next, the next, that night I slept, uh, that was like one o'clock in the afternoon. And I, I slept till about seven that night. Um, and then the father, um, of my daughter came in and, and it was this, this instant, I didn't like him. I didn't like who he was. He was just this, I don't like you. I could see his energy. I didn't like him. And, and then I went to sleep. So, You know, it's funny. It sounds to me that your partner and your father were very similar, particularly in the treatment of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you believe you may have chosen these particular relationships? For example, some say premortally. They've made choices to have certain disruptive relationships in their lives as a part of some sort of learning experience in order to be on a higher frequency spiritually. I I totally agree with you. And, um, you know, um, going 20 years past, we're not quite there yet in the journey, but I ended up writing a book and totally that's absolutely the outcome of it. So I look forward to showing that later. But yes, absolutely. You know, he, uh, yes, he was, well, there was a lot more going on with him than, than uh, my father. Um, he was like involved in things that he should, yeah, it was, <laughs> okay, how do I, exp- yeah, mind boggling. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we have these um, memories with the emotional um, attachments to them and we will project that out into the universe to attract the people that we need in order to heal and release those, those energies. So absolutely. Yep. So what was it like attempting to speak about your experience for the first time? You know, I, 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 it was in 1989. There was no internet. Um, There was very little literature. I didn't even know what happened to me. So I went through the experience um, and then I, I didn't want to go back to the house because I knew it was very dark energy, but I didn't have a choice. You know, my, my parents were dark energy. My, 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 my partner was dark energy and I just, I didn't know what to do. So uh, I went back to the house and within, within weeks, I discovered um, that there were 
things going on with his children, they ended up getting apprehended and sent back to the mother through social services. Um, and yeah, it was, it was extremely, extremely challenging. Uh, almost, ter- it was terrifying. I, I didn't know how to fit back into my life. Many say they come back from an experience with heightened abilities. I know you spoke about seeing dark energies earlier. Did you return with any new abilities of your own? Absolutely. Uh, I came back with the ability, and I didn't understand it at that time, but now I totally do. Um, I'm able to see people's challenges, people's issues. Yeah, it's like listening between the lines. That's what I call it. Not the sixth sense, but I can listen between the lines like, I can see and hear and feel um, things that they are challenged with. And, and, and sometimes I say it and sometimes I don't, just depending on where they're at mentally and emotionally, right? If your parents were in your life at the time, did you attempt to tell them about your experience? Yeah, my parents are definitely in my life. Um, my father was still trying to be abusive and controlling to me. Um, and when I finally came to the point where I started sharing my truth, uh, I was completely alienated by my family. Uh, they refused to accept what I was saying. And um, yeah, I lost, I lost contact with my grandparents at the time, um, my parents. And then my, my dad actually passed away a year after my experience. So I never, I never, com- would have, I never confronted him, but I never would have because of how abusive he was. It it wouldn't have gone over well. They, I would not have been able to. Now, when you say you were alienated, was it because of your near-death experience or something unrelated to it? I didn't share the account with anybody because I thought it was crazy. Like I didn't, I went, I actually went to pastors. I went to psychologists, psychiatrists. I even went back to the doctor that was in the OR um, and none of them could give me answers. And it wasn't until four years later, I was I was prompted to turn the TV on and there was this Nova show and these people were sitting around the table and I actually still have the VCR tape. I still have it. They were sitting there. They were sitting around the table and they were sharing their near death experiences with terminal cancer patients. Now this is probably 1991 or 92. And um, I think it was back from the light or I'm not sure. I can't remember what the show was called. It's no, it was Nova. And in that moment, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. Like I, I didn't tell anybody about my experience until that happened. In that moment, it was like my family. Oh, I love you. Like it was like finally for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And in many cases, near death experiencers uh, who tend not to speak about their experience out of fear that the world may find them or label them as crazy, usually find complete joy in discovering a counterpart experiencer. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the craziest, the guy that I was living with was involved in some very dark, um, actually satanic. <laughs> I can, oh. I have letters. I have letters okay. to prove. Yeah. He was involved in a satanic cult. Honestly. And, and so for me, I, I knew that if I had shared my experience, I would have ended up in a, in a, in a white jacket <laughs> rocking back and forth in a hospital. So that's a huge reason why I didn't say anything, you know, because, and, and I didn't understand. I didn't, I truly did not understand what happened to me. You know, it was like one minute I'm in the drama. I'm living this drama life and the next minute I'm in the audience and I can see all this drama and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea. Now, this is interesting. You say your living partner was in a satanic cult. Did you know any of this prior to being involved with him? Nope. Nope. I had no idea. And I didn't even know until like three years later because he was trying to get custody of our daughter and, um, the way the whole thing played out, I ended up uh, getting the, his children into counseling um, and they were in this program. And then when he was trying to get custody, we ended up with a section 15, which was a, a court order to be both of us interviewed in, in, in BC, Canada. Um, so we were both interviewed and then the, the social worker said to me, give me something to hang on to. And I remember the, 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 the counselor that was working with the children, she gave me 
her number and said, if you ever need me, call me. And so I gave the number to him and he called them and he said, this is the first time I've ever done this, but I'm denying access to the natural father. And then the next thing I know, I get this letter that says, you know, there was occult practices with the children and possibly with the, with my, our daughter. And I actually still have the letter. I still have a copy of the letter. Do you know by any chance what types of practices were being conducted? No, you, I, you know, I have a good idea based on going back over it. Um, I have a pretty good idea of what was going down. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it's just hearsay. I don't have any proof. Well, <laughs> Talk about a dichotomy, you going into the light and him practicing within the dark and literally speaking as he kept you in the dark. So let's move back into the light a bit. Let's talk about your healing practice. Not only did you return from your experience with an ability to read between the lines as you spoke of earlier, but uh, perhaps your healing practice stems from this as well. Tell us about this practice and how it works. Well, I, I spent a lot of time, um, of course, working on myself. Um, and I would go, I went to, you know, a lot of psychologists, you know, and they wanted to talk about what was going on. I knew that wasn't going to work for me. Um, and so I just, you know, and, and so I kept trying other practices and then I ended up meeting up with this psychologist. And she was like sort of new age. It was 25 years ago and people would have gone, you know, granola new age. Anyway, um, I ended up working with her and she taught me these techniques that were phenomenal. Um, and so for 10 years I worked with her and she also worked with, with my daughter that had been, you know, involved in, um, she was, my daughter had actually been involved in some ritual abuse. Um, and so she worked with my daughter and we pieced everything together, pieced the whole story. And then she taught me these techniques. And so, uh, after the 10 years, because I had a, a, a you know, a, um, a, um, a file uh, with the police, I received free counseling. And then after the 10 years, she said to me, you know, you can do this on your own, which kind of upset me because I thought, well, you know, I struggled for weeks at a time when I could have actually been working on myself. But so I took her techniques and I, and I started working on myself with them. And I started refining them and then I started studying other practices like hypnosis, uh, EMDR, tapping, um, and, and NLP, Neuro Linguistic Practi- Practitioners. Um, and so I started studying all of these different um, healing techniques and uh, figured out what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And um, it's, yeah, it's been quite a journey. I actually ended up writing a book about it and um, just the book was probably more healing than anything, just getting my story off me and onto paper. But yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been an incredible journey. And so now what I do um, is I use these techniques. I've honed them in. I've really um, created, uh, you know, very powerful ways to help um, people heal. And um, I've come to this, Um, understanding that a lot of us deal with a victim mindset or have been bullied or, um, you know, struggle with positive or emotion, negative emotional, emotional uh, memory. And I've created this way to actually go into the subconscious and heal. And I'd say this probably does stem from your experience because it was there that you learned that you aren't the victim you thought you were. So now you're just reteaching this to others in an earthly version. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the the most important thing I learned was that I was this beautiful spiritual being having this earthly experience and the earthly experience wasn't who I was. Um, It was my experience and I learned that and I can unlearn it. And, you know, that, that, that goes with everything, including anxiety, fear, um, victim mindset, all of it. That's, it's all learned and you can actually unlearn it. Fascinating. And you know, we live in a day and age where people are working more hours. They're working more than one job, which is triggering a lot of the depression and anxiety we're seeing, uh, and them trying to excel professionally and trying to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. 
What would you say to these individuals, knowing what you know now, who may believe they are the jobs, they are the professions, they are the salaries they make, they are the depressions and the anxieties that come out of that? The most profound way that I can explain that is that I know that every person that's listening to this podcast has has come to a place in their life where they've had to make a decision. And they have been in this emotional turmoil of, you know, this way, that way, this way, what do I do? I don't know. I don't know. And all of a sudden, they they step back. They go into the audience and they look at the what's going truly going on in their life. They look at, you know, the 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 emotional part of it. They look at the drama. They look at all of that. They sit in the audience and they go, oh, okay, I know what I need to do. When you're in the audience, you're actually in the present moment. You are actually being one with your source. That present moment is your gift. And so, so prevalent right now. I just encourage everybody to just have those moments. You've all had those moments when you've stepped out and you've gone, oh, okay, I know what I need to do. That's the present moment. And, you know, if, if, if everybody could just step out and be in that space, um, you'll connect with your source. It's, it's, you know, people talk about meditating, med- meditation, but when you're struggling with negative, uh, drama and, and negative subconscious, it's really hard to meditate. So if you could just have those moments where you can just pull back and be in the audience and, and realize that that's your, pre- that's the present moment. And many near-death experiencers talk about having a feeling of being or doing in the moment, as you say, how time doesn't really exist. So perhaps if we can get an idea of this, we can change the way we view life here. Absolutely. You know, the most, the, the craziest thing that I've discovered is that, you know, when you're a child, time stands still. Like, you, you know, Christmas is like three days and it takes like 15 days to get there. It's like, oh, oh my God. Okay, we close it. When you're, when you have released the negative negativity and the baggage in your life and you're not, you're not slipping into the subconscious and you're not slipping into the, you know, the, the negative memory and you're not slipping into that. Once you heal that, once you release that, the time is, is like, oh, like my days are so long and so beautiful and so protect, productive because I'm not spending my days slipping into my subconscious. Wonderful. Tell us the name of your book and where we can find it. So the name of my book is uh, 31 Dimes from Heaven, uh, The Secrets I Learned from My Near-Death Experience. It is available on Amazon, hard copy. Um, I also can e- you know, email a copy. I have an ebook copy. The reason why I named the book 31 Dimes from Heaven was because when I started writing it, I started finding dimes everywhere. And the dime story, there's a dime story in there that was a pivotal uh, switch in my life, uh, brought me into the present moment. And um, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty crazy story. Perhaps a sign from heaven. It was, it was, definitely. I still find dimes. <laughs> and if you get enough of those, please send them my way. <laughs> Sarah, I want to thank you for coming on Real Spiritual Talk Radio and sharing your experience. I am quite certain that those listening will find your experience extremely enlightening and greatly helpful. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, if people want to reach out to me, check out Present Living Academy on Facebook private message me. I would love to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been so great to talk to you, Lamont. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah McClellan. And I want to thank you all for tuning in to another edition of Real Spiritual Talk Radio. Please go to my Facebook page, Real Spiritual Talk Radio, as well as my YouTube channel. You can type in my name, Lamont Gates, and there you will find past shows as well as up and coming video footage on the cutting room floor and there you will find cutting room floor video conversations with my past guests that did not make it into the audio podcast and with that said i am your host lamont gates and real spiritual talk radio is now signing off